Welcome back everyone and for those of you guys who don't like creepy crawlies um, I just want to warn you right now you just moved from the frying pan into the fire. Uh, we finished talking about worms but now we're going to be talking about arthropods for the next three lectures and arthropods um, include spiders, insects, crustaceans, scorpions and various other uh, things that kind of creep around and crawl and crustaceans. So um, if you're not a big fan of those things, just hang on through for the next three lectures um, and, and it'll be all right. Hopefully this is interesting, uh, more interesting than, than it is creepy. Um, so anyway, we're going to start with chapter 19, looking at um, the trilobites, chalicerates, and myriapods. So before we talk about specific arthropods, I think it's important for us to understand what arthropods are and some key shared characteristics that they have. So arthropods belong to the large phyla called arthropoda, and arthropoda is the largest and most diverse phyla of all animals on this planet. All arthropods have a cuticle, and unlike the cuticle that we saw in nematodes, which was primarily composed of collagen, the cuticle in arthropods is primarily composed of protein and the carbohydrate or the polysaccharide chitin. And chitin is the same polysaccharide that's present in the cell wall of fungi, but in this case, it's in the cuticle of arthropods. And the cuticle provides a couple of um, advantages to arthropods. For one, it provides them with protection. Um, this is protection from predators. It can be protection from uh, falls from high heights. It can protect them from environmental threats such as dehydration uh, due to evaporation. It can provide them with a lot of different protection from uh, various threats and stresses. Additionally, the cuticle provides a more secure attachment point for the organism's muscles. So in soft bodied organisms, they don't have a, as strong of an attachment point. And this, um, this attachment of muscles directly to the cuticle has been attributed to the rapid locomotion and the ability to fly in arthropods. And then also the cuticle is, it surrounds the entire organism's body, but not evenly all around. There are places um, at sutures and joints within the organism at their segments or at jointed locations on their appendages where the cuticle is much thinner. And this allows for the organism to be able to move because if their cuticle was the same thickness all the way around, they wouldn't be mobile. Um, and because they have a cuticle, they must undergo a dysis or molting. So they are a dysozoans. And so you can see that in this picture, this picture actually goes in order from uh, one, two, three, and four. But um, once you look at, if you look at image two, you can see the uh, fly kind of peeling its way out of the exoskeleton, which is attached to this branch. And then by the time you get to image four, you can see the fly has completely removed itself from its exoskeleton, um, which is still attached to the branch. And then it will later go on to make a new exoskeleton so that it can protect itself. So once it first leaves its exoskeleton, um, it's actually very soft and vulnerable until it can make a new one. All arthropods stem from a shared common ancestor that was referred to as a protoarthropod. And that protoarthropod had to undergo a process called arthropodization or arthropodization. Um, and this, uh, this term is actually defined as the stiffening of the cuticle to form a jointed exoskeleton. Um, but it is also a couple other uh, stages and steps to get from the early arthropod ancestor to what we know as an arthropod today. Um, it includes, of course, the stiffening of the cuticle um, to make this, this hard exoskeleton but also the process of molting. So the ability to get rid of that old exoskeleton so you can grow and then make a new exoskeleton. Also um, in their early ancestors, the coelom became regressed and is actually replaced with the hemoseal. And um, their early, 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 early ancestors also had motile cilia. And so uh, to get to modern day arthropods, those protoarthropods had to lose those motile cilia because um, they were not necessary anymore. So there are five subphyla of arthropods underneath the phylum arthropoda, and they include trilobita, which includes trilobites, which are all extinct. We'll talk about those today in this lecture. Um, also myriapoda and uh, 
that includes centipedes and millipedes. We'll talk about that today. And chalicerata, which includes the uh, spiders, ticks, mites, horseshoe crabs, daddy long legs, um, and some other organisms. And we'll talk about those in this lecture. In the next lecture, we'll talk about the subphylum crustacea, which includes crabs, lobsters, and barnacles. And then in the third lecture, we'll talk about phylum hexapoda, which includes all the insects. As I mentioned before, phylum arthropoda is the largest and most diverse phyla of animals on this planet. So to give some perspective of that, three-fourths of all known animal species belong to this phyla. So that's a lot of animals and it's a lot of diversity. And their ability to um, have all this diversity and to be as abundant as they are is largely attributed to their ability to adapt very quickly. And so when you combine their uh, rapid adaptation to their relatively uh, fast reproduction rate, you can see how they've been able to spread all over the planet and occupy almost every niche you can think of on, on Earth. Arthropods are ecdysozoan protostomes. So we talked about that, how they have to undergo ecdysis. So they have to shed their um, outer cuticle in order to grow. And they're protostomes, so they develop mouth first. They have segmented bodies, and the segmentation that we see in arthropods is different from what we see in annelids. We'll talk about that a little bit more um, in the next upcoming couple slides, so just uh, hold on to that thought. They also have jointed appendages, and you can see that pretty clearly in some of these pictures. So this picture of this uh, honeypot ant here, you can look at its front leg. And you can see uh, very clearly a couple of the joints that it has. So there's a joint here and then there's a joint here. Um, you can also see it in this orchid mantis up here with their legs. Um, you can see pretty clearly their joint here and a joint down here. Um, so they just have uh, jointed appendages and you'll see a variety of different types of appendages as we go through. Arthropods can be herbivorous, carnivorous, or omnivores. So it just depends on the species that you're looking at and um, the environmental conditions. They can be uh, aquatic. So we have shrimp, krill, um, uh, lobsters, crabs, things like that are obviously aquatic. You also have some a lot of terrestrial species. So if you go outside, almost anything you see when you step outside your door, obviously are terrestrial species like uh, spiders, ants, flies, moths, things like that. They can live an aerial lifestyle. So many of them have the ability to fly um, so they can get from one place to another um, and get away from predators and catch prey and things like that in the air. And then some of them live on or inside other organisms. So some examples of this that you're probably uh, relatively familiar with are mites and ticks that are parasitic and they um, live on or in particular hosts for a period of time in their life. And the phylogenetics of arthropods is highly dynamic. So there are a lot of new technologies and insights that we're gaining over time that have um, changed how we organize the uh, groupings of arthropods so that they can get to actual true mo uh, mono monophyletic groupings, sorry. Um, so we're not gonna go through a whole bunch of the phylogenetic analyses for arthropods. Um, it just wants you to know that there's a lot of uh, mo changes that are occurring in this very, very large group of animals. And as we learn more and um, get access to new technologies, there will definitely um, be more changes to how we understand the relationship between all of these various organisms. Some examples of arthropods include uh, spiders, ticks, crustaceans like shrimp and krill, uh, millipedes, ants, moths, butterflies. The list just goes on and on and on. This group is incredibly diverse and we'll talk about a few of these as we're going through the lectures. So I mentioned before that the uh, success of arthropods on this planet has been largely attributed to their ability to rapidly adapt. And so now we're just gonna talk about some of those adaptations um, that have allowed for them to be as diverse and abundant as they are today. The first big one is the development of a cuticle. So we talked about the cuticle a little bit already and how it provides protection for the organism from physical and environmental threats and how it's also flexible at the joints and sutures to allow for movement while they're also being protected. And all of this together means that the cuticle is highly mobile. So um, it's almost like they're constantly walking around with a suit of armor because unless they have just molted their um, 
cuticle, they constantly have that protection with them. And even after they've molted, um, they, when they're most vulnerable, they eventually, um, as soon as possible, will make a new cuticle so that they protect it. So they spend as little amount of time as possible being um, vulnerable to predators and uh, environmental stresses. The cuticle is produced by the epidermis, and all of you by now know what the epidermis is, but it's shown here in this picture, and it's the outermost layer of living tissue. And the uh, cuticle is composed of two main components. The first one we're going to talk about is the procuticle, and the procuticle basically covers all the area from just uh, above the epidermis all the way up to something we call the epicuticle. And we'll talk about the epicuticle in a second, but um, that, that vast bulk of the cuticle is the procuticle. And the procuticle is broken up into two segments itself. We have the exocuticle, which is the outermost uh, part of the cuticle, and that part is secreted before molting. And we have the endocuticle, which is the uh, innermost part or the part that's closest to the epidermis and that's secreted after molting. And um, all the procuticle together, in combination with the epicuticle, which we'll talk about in a second, um, all protect the organism from a variety of stresses, and the biggest one being dehydration. And this is important specifically, um, or more importantly, for terrestrial arthropods, because air is constantly trying to evaporate the water from their tissues. Water wants to naturally move out of their tissues um, because there's less uh, water in the environment, so of course diffusion. But the, having this cuticle helps, to, uh, helps them to maintain water in their tissues so they don't dry out and become a dried out dead husk. And then some arthropods have opted to incorporate calcium salts into their procuticle, and this allows for calcification, so the cuticle becomes far more um, strong and dense. And this is great for protecting the organism, but it does come at a cost. It, it reduces the flexibility of those organisms. A good example of this is in crabs. Um, I don't I don't eat crab that you have to open up, but for those of you guys who have you know there's like that little tool that you have to use to break open the shell and uh, that that crunch noise that you hear once you snap the shell and it breaks um, that crunch noise is due to the fact that you've uh, broken the cuticle and the cuticle was so dense because of those calcium salts and you don't hear that same noise if you step on uh, a spider or something like that because they haven't incorporated calcium salts into their exoskeleton so it's a lot more flexible then they have the, the other component of the cuticle is the epicuticle. And the epicuticle is the outermost layer of the cuticle. And it's primarily composed of cross-linked proteins and lipids. And it contains waxes on the outer side to prevent water loss. So this is why I said the cuticle mixed with the procuticle together help to prevent dehydration in the organism. And both um, the epicuticle and the procuticle are composed of um, thin, like many, many, many thin layers of uh, cuticle that's being excreted from or being produced by the epidermis. And these are called lamina. And you can see it in this picture here. They've tried to draw it as like striated uh, lines here. But it's kind of like when we were talking about in mollusks, how they make their shell layer by layer, um, starting at the mantle. Very similar thing here. The cuticle is made layer by layer. So the more layers you have, the thicker the cuticle you have, the, the stronger the cuticle is. There, um, as I mentioned before, there are thin segments um, at the joints that allow for the arthropod to move. And um, there are also mus muscle attachments directly to the uh, cuticle. And these actual attachment points are called apodemes. Um, and that's exactly where the, the, the site of location is, where the muscle is attached to the cuticle. And we had talked about before how this allows for the organisms to move more quickly and has allowed for them to have flight and uh, various other advantages when it comes to movement. And also some of their organs and appendages are also lined with cuticle depending on the species. Some other adaptations that have allowed for the success of arthropods is segmentation and the development of specialized appendages. Segmentation in arthropods is different from what we see in annelids um, because the segments in arthropods have become fused into specialized functional groups. 
All arthropods came from a shared ancestor that was fully segmented, but modern day arthropods, uh, when they're undergoing embryonic development, their uh, segments, two or more of them will begin to fuse into these com combined segments that have specialized functions. And these uh, different segments are called tagmata. And so in different types of arthropods, we see different types of segmentation. Um, one that you're probably familiar with from grade school is the head, thorax, abdomen um, segmentation. And so you can see that here in this uh, grasshopper, they have three tagma or tagmata, and they have the head, thorax just posterior to the head and then the abdomen which is everything that's posterior to the thorax and then we also have the uh, segmentation of the cephalothorax and abdomen like we see in spiders the cephalothorax is just the head and the thorax have also fused into uh, one uh, one structure and in this spider we can see the cephalothorax is all this region here including the legs and then everything that's posterior to the cephalothorax is the abdomen. And then finally, we also have the um, segmentation of head trunk. And we can see that in uh, myriapods where they have their head region. And then everything posterior to the head is the trunk. And in addition to the segmentation, arthropods have differentiated and specialized appendages. And all these appendages are able to move via striated muscles, so including their antennae and their legs and um, their pedipalps and chelicerae, all that stuff. And then they also have um, other structures such as sensory hairs, bristles, and spines that help them to uh, sense changes in their environment. Um, additionally, arthropods have trachea, and trachea are tubes that run from the uh, outside of the body into the internal uh, organs and muscles of the body and they're responsible for delivering oxygen to the cells and tissues that need it and removing co2 from the organism's body and these trachea have allowed for the um, arthropods to have a higher metabolic rate than let's say flatworms that have to undergo diffusion um, but it also they also limit the potential size of arthropods so the reason why we don't uh, see grasshoppers the size of people or the size of uh, elephants is because of the trachea. So trachea can only penetrate so deep within the arthropod's body um, and if they can't get to certain tissues and organs those tissues will die. And so this is why um, insects and crustaceans and spiders and all types of arthropods are all relatively small um, except for, you know, some of them are, can be pretty big, like three feet, but that's still small compared to um, larger animals. And that's because uh, if they got any bigger, then they would basically suffocate and die. In addition to the trachea, arthropods can have gills and lungs, depending on if they're aquatic or terrestrial uh, species. Um, also, they have highly developed sensory organs, which helps them to sense their environment, to catch prey, um, to interact with other arthropods in their communities and things like that. They have complex behavioral patterns, both innate and learned behaviors. And this is to me most interesting to see in ants because they have these complex um, mutualistic relationships with each other that they they work together to form these colonies and there's hierarchies in these colonies and they have roads that they make on the on the uh, forest floors and things like that like how ants behave is really really interesting and um, these complex behaviors have uh, like this or various other behaviors that arthropods have with their environment have allowed them to be as successful as they are and then finally, the ability to undergo metamorphosis. So metamorphosis is the transition from the larval stage to the adult stage of the arthropod. And this is uh, beneficial to the success of arthropods because the larval stage and the adult stage generally um, require different resources and occupy different niches. And this limits the amount of competition between the larva and the adult form. So if they were both competing for the same resources, then maybe the larvae would miss out. And if you don't have any larvae, you don't have any adults. Or maybe the adults miss out. And then if you have just larvae, then they never undergo reproduction. So you don't get the cycle keeps going, right? So having metamorphosis where the larvae um, occupy a different niche and require different resources than the adult forms 
allows for them to uh, be more successful. Okay, so there's one more thing I wanna do before we uh, jump into some examples, and that's to go over some vocabulary. So of course, we've already learned a lot of vocabulary and we'll continue to learn more, but there are some key terms that I, I wanted to make sure that everyone knew and understood before we moved forward. And the first two terms are uniramus versus biramus appendages. And this just means, are the appendages of the arthropod unbranched or branched? So an example of a uniramus uh, appendage can be seen in this picture of a bee. So this bee's appendages here and here are singular uh, jointed pieces with no branching. So they're just one long appendage. Um, and then an example of biramus uh, appendages you can see here in this lobster. So if we look at the tail appendage, there is a singular piece that then branches off to two lobes. So the singular piece is here that then branches off to form two lobes of that appendage. So that's biramus. The single appendage branches to form two pieces. Same thing you can see here with this appendage, there's a shared singular uh, piece that then branches off to two pieces. So biramus. Some other examples of uniramus uh, arthropods include hexapods, which are all of your insects. Hexapod just means six legs. And then your myriapods, which we'll talk about in this lecture, which are your centipedes and your millipedes. And then some examples of biramus um, appendages uh, in arthropods are your lobsters and other crustaceans like shrimp and krill. And then you have your trilobites, which we'll talk about in this lecture um, in the next couple slides. And then the gene that is responsible for determining if the arthropod will have uh, uniramus or biramus ramus appendages is called DLL. And this gene is a uh, early developmental gene, so it's a Hox gene. Um, you don't have to know a lot about this gene, just know that people have been able to manipulate this gene to make a uh, arthropod that normally is uniramus become biramus and vice versa. So this gene is what's responsible for uh, these types of appendages in these arthropods. So the next two terms are the chelicerae versus mandibles, and um, they're very similar, but they differ in their function. So chelicerae are a pair of appendages in the front of the mouth that are used for grasping or piercing. And you can see them really well in this picture of, the, of a spider. So these pieces here, that one and this one, are the chelicerae. And you can see clearly in this spider how they can be used for piercing um, and grasping prey. In the case of venomous spiders, their um, chelicerae have fangs on the end, and those fangs are responsible for injecting venom into their prey because they act like a um, hypodermic syringe. So they're hollow in the center and they connect to venom uh, pouches and the venom will basically run from the venom sacs through the fangs and into the prey. Um, these uh, chelicerae in uh, scorpions are a little bit different. They are modified into pincers or claws. So they can have a little bit of variability, but their main function is for grasping and piercing prey. And then the other mouth parts we have are the mandibles. And so you can see the mandibles here in this picture of a grasshopper. And the mandibles are just a pair of appendages that are near the mouth that are responsible for chewing or cutting. So the mandibles are responsible for breaking prey down into smaller, more manageable pieces, whereas the chelicerae are responsible for helping to capture and debilitate the prey. And then some other structures we have around the mouth are the pedipalps. And the pedipalps are seen here in this spider. They're really easy to see in the spider uh, picture. And they can have a variety of functions depending on the organism. So in the case of the spider, they're responsible for helping the spider sense its environment, so helping it to catch prey and avoid predators. But in scorpions, the pedipalps have pincers on the end, so those large uh, pincers that we associate with uh, scorpions are uh, modified uh, pedipalps. And then in horseshoe crabs, they use their pedipalps for locomotion. So there's a lot of variability on what the function of pedipalps can be, but they are also uh, located kind of at the front anterior end of the um, organism. 
You can also see um, a different type of palp in other organisms. So you can see that here in this arthropod, this is also an example of the uh, pedipalp or palp. And then a final structure around the mouth that I want to talk about are the maxilla. So the maxilla are the regions here. There we go. And they're mouth parts that are responsible for tasting and manipulating food. Okay, so to move on to some structures that are not uh, involved with the mouth, we're going to talk about the trachea. So trachea are these tube-like uh, structures that are responsible for bringing oxygen into the organism so that they can undergo gas exchange um, and release CO2 back into the environment. And they have an opening to the outside environment called the spiracle, which is here. In caterpillars, you can see this really well, so I would say recommend looking up spiracle and they'll show you plenty of pictures of caterpillars where you can see them, they're quite large. Some organisms, they're a little bit harder to see. They're just basically openings um, on the exoskeleton of the organism that open up to the environment. And that allows for oxygen to freely flow into the trachea. And then the trachea tubes become thinner and thinner as they go deeper into the organism. And they come in contact directly with muscle cells and organ cells to allow for gas exchange. And they also allow for um, the organism's blood cells become in contact with the trachea to uh, exchange CO2 for oxygen. So this is basically like, uh, in combination with the lungs and gills, these are the respiratory organs of arthropods. And then finally, we have the antenna, which many of you have seen antenna, especially if you've seen ants and um, uh, like lobsters, where they have these long, thin sensory appendages on the head that help them sense their environment. Okay, finally, we can get into some examples of some arthropods. We're going to start with subphylum trilobita, and trilobita includes trilobites. And trilobites are a group of extinct arthropods that went extinct about 245 million years ago. They were dorsally ventrally flattened um, uh, arthropods, and they had a very thick chitin exoskeleton that was reinforced with calcium carbonate. And that thick uh, uh, exoskeleton is the reason why we have so much fossilized evidence of them today. So when we're looking at fossils, um, just as a side note, um, when there's hard tissues like bones and exoskeletons, they will fossilize more readily than soft tissues do. So when you have an organism like these that has a tough uh, outer exoskeleton, they're more likely to fossilize and then that's why we have so many fossils of these guys. There were three tagmata in the trilobites. They had a head, trunk, and a pygidium. So their head, and we're going to use this picture here because I think it's the easiest to see. Their head region was like here, and it included a pair of antennae. They also had compound eyes, a mouth, of course, and they had four leg-like appendages. And then they had their trunk region, which is from the head down to here, so right before the pygidium. And so this is head, it's trunk. And their trunk region varied in the number of segments depending on the species, um, but each segment had a pair of biramous appendages. You can't see it in this fossil, but if I were to draw it, I would say um, there was a biramous appendage here. So it started as one piece and branched. And here, one piece and branch, but each segment had two. So there's one on this side, one piece and branch, one piece and branch, right? So that was uh, kind of a really crude drawing, but how they had appendages on each of the segments except for their last two segments. So these two segments did not have appendages on them, but all the other segments did. And then the final part of their um, body plan is the pygidium. And it was a fused uh, plate, which you can see here. It's definitely structurally different than the other uh, segments of their body. 
All the trilobites are thought to have been bottom dwellers, and um, we think that they were either uh, scavengers or particle feeders or predators. They could have been a combination of all these things depending on the environmental conditions. Um, it's based on their morphology and, and similarities to current day um, similar organisms. They're, they assume they probably were scavengers, predators, or particle feeders or some combination of that. The next subphylum is Chalicerata. Um, these are all the arthropods that have chalicera. And as a reminder, chalicera were the mouth parts that were responsible for gripping or piercing your prey. And chalicerates have two um, tagmata. They have a cephalothorax and an abdomen. And as a reminder, the cephalothorax is the fusion of the head and thorax segments to form kind of one big piece that they call the cephalothorax. And in this spider image, you can pretty easily see it. It includes all of the legs and this most anterior part of the spider. And then everything posterior to the cephalothorax is the abdomen. So this part is the abdomen. And you can also see it in a scorpion. They have a relatively small cephalothorax and they also have uh, an abdomen that's broken up into a couple of pieces. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes when we get to the scorpion part of the lecture. But for now, you can see the cephalothorax here. It's relatively small compared to the spider cephalothorax. And then they have the abdomen, which is everything posterior to the, uh, the cephalothorax. So the main part of the body and the tail. They also have six pairs of appendages. So they have two chalicera, which are seen here. They have two pedipalps, and they have uh, four pairs of walking legs. So they have the one, two, three, four pairs, and they do not have antenna. Most um, are carnivorous and they uh, drink the liquid <laughs> remains of their prey and that's how they feed. Um, so they're all carnivores, but they feed in slightly different ways. So in the case of like spiders we talked about, they will inject venom using their fangs into their prey. And then that venom not only incapac incapacitates their prey, but it also contains enzymes that start to break down the prey from the inside out. And then they basically will just suck up the liquefied remains of their prey once the enzymes have broken them down. Uh, scorpions will use a similar technique. There are three classes of um, arthropods within this subphylum, and that includes Myristomata, which have your uh, horseshoe crabs, Pycnogonita, which are your sea spiders, and then Arachnia, which includes your um, Arachnida, which includes your spiders, ticks, mites, and scorpions. The class Myristomata is composed of the horseshoe crabs, and uh, these unusual looking guys um, have a lot of similarities to some fossils that we've seen that go back to the Triassic period. So that may indicate that this lineage is ancient in many ways, but um, this is what they look like if you've never seen one. And even though they look a little odd, a lot of uh, current research is being done on their blood and various aspects of them that have been uh, medically related to even humans. But anyway, so uh, the uh, horseshoe crabs have an unsegmented carapace, which is shaped like a horseshoe, which is how they get their name. So that carapace is all of this section here, which is kind of like their hard ex exoskeleton on the anterior part of their body. Um, you can see that here as well in the picture is what we're looking at is the carapace. And then on their carapace, they have two rudimentary compound eyes and then two simple eyes. So in this picture down here, you can see their um, rudimentary compound eye, which one is here and then one's on this other side. Um, you can also see it here in this picture. And then you can't see the simple eyes very well, but in this picture, they're trying to show you that their simple eye is towards the um, most anterior region of their carapace. They also have the segmentation like we talked about. They have a cephalothorax and they have a uh, abdomen. So their cephalothorax um, contains two cellicerae, uh, cellicerae, two pedipalps and eight legs. And you can see that when you look at the bottom of the organism. So they have the cellicerae, 
you have your uh, petit palps, which are this, these ones here, and then you have your walking legs. So one, two, three, and four um, pairs of walking legs. And then they have a very broad abdomen, which is this whole posterior region here. And their abdomen is composed of six fused appendages, six pairs of fused appendages, and they're hard to see. But if you kind of look at the spines on this font, this image at the bottom, you can kind of see what kind of remains of those appendages. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six spines on both sides. And each of those um, at one point may have been individual appendages that have now become fused. They also have gills on their abdomen. And though each of those appendages, except for the last one, so five out of the six appendages has a pair of gills and that can be seen here. And they also have a long tail called a, a telson. So that's what you're seeing in this part of the image is their telson. And you can kind of see it in this picture here, it's going off screen. They live in shallow waters and they ex undergo external fertilization on land. So when they're ready to mate, the females will crawl on the beach um, at high tide and then they'll lay their eggs in the sand just above uh, high tide. And then the males will come in and add their sperm to the, um, the area where the uh, females lay their eggs before the females cover them up with sand. And then that will allow for fertilization of the eggs and then the uh, young will develop within the sand. And then once they are ready to go, they'll leave the sand and travel back um, at a high tide back to the ocean so they can live out their lives. The larvae of horseshoe crabs are segmented, which also gives you a good indicator of their segmented ancestor. And horseshoe crabs are not the only um, organism within this, this group. They're just the only extant one. There is an extinct uh, species uh, <laughs> within this group called the giant water scorpion, which sounds incredibly terrifying um, so I'm kind of glad they're not around but the thing to note is horseshoe crabs are really the only extant species that we know of right now that fits within this uh, class. The class Pycnogonida includes a group of organisms that we call sea spiders. They're not actually spiders because they're not arachnids but they kind of look like skeletal spiders so that's what we call them that and they're aquatic so sea spiders. Um, you can see an example here they kind of have like a skeletal kind of look to them. They have a head that has a couple of different uh, key components to it. They have the chalicera, which are around the mouth for grasping food and, and piercing food. Then they also have their palps. And then they have a proboscis in the center, which contains the mouth. And then they also have their four pairs of walking legs. One, two, three, four. And then something you can't see in this image is um, their eyes. So they have eyes that are raised from their body on tentacle-like structures, but you can't really see it in either of these pictures too well. They also um, generally have four pairs of legs, but sometimes they may have more. And this is because they have a unique characteristic about them where they might have an extra repeated segment or a couple of repeated segments. And so that means instead of having four pairs of walking legs, if some of them have one or two extra repeated segments, they may have five or six pairs of walking legs. So the four is not always consistent, but for the most part, they have uh, four pairs of walking legs. Something else interesting about these, um, these organisms is the fact that the males will actually carry the developing eggs on these uh, modified appendages called ovigers. And they can be seen here in this image as these appendages on the, these longer appendages here. So the males will carry them around and, and keep them safe until the young are, are ready to be released. The um, sea spiders do not have a uh, excretory or respiratory system. They just undergo diffusion. You can imagine they're so thin, they don't really need it. Um, but they do have a simple dorsal heart and they do have digestive system and um, a uh, reproductive system. But because they're so thin and their center of their body is so limited, um, their digestive system and their gonads often extend into their legs. To, so they have enough space to be fully developed. 
And then, um, like I mentioned, they, they're aquatic. We call them sea spiders because they live mostly in marine environments. And they seem to thrive really well, particularly at the polar waters the most. They can live in various areas, but they do really well in the cold water at the poles. The last class of arthropods we're going to talk about in the subphylum Calicerata are those that belong to the class Arachnida. And this includes the spiders, scorpions, ticks, mites, and daddy long legs as some examples. And we'll talk about many of these um, individually in the next couple slides. The, some of the first early colonizers of uh, land were thought to belong to this class. And all of the organisms have the cephalothorax abdomen um, segmentation. And on their cephalothorax, they have their two chalicera, they have two pedipalps, and their four walking legs, like we've seen um, in the organisms previously. And they also often have fangs, claws, or venom glands on their cephalothorax to help them with catching prey. Um, fangs are modified chalicera, like we talked about before, and claws are actually modified pedipalps. So we talked about that before as well in... Um, scorpions, how those those large claws we see when you normally think of a scorpion, um, those are modified pedipalps. And then on their abdomen region, it usually contains their reproductive structures and their respiratory organs, as well as um, they may have a stinger or um, spinning glands on their abdomen for catching prey and making webs for various reasons. Order Arania are the spiders, and all spiders have a shared common ancestor that actually had a segmented abdomen, similar to what we see in scorpions. Um, vast majority of modern day spiders do not have a segmented abdomen anymore, but some of them do, but most of them don't, and instead they have just one large uh, abdominal piece. So spiders have eight eyes. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and despite the fact that they have a lot of eyes, they don't have really good eyesight. So they rely on a lot of other ways to sense their environment. And we'll talk about those in a second. Um, some of them do have good eyesight if they're actively chasing down prey and things. But the vast majority of spiders do not. They also have fangs, like we mentioned before, um, that help them to catch their prey. Um, because it helps them to inject venom into their prey to incapacitate them and start to break them down. They also have teeth, which can be seen here, that help them with chewing their prey to break it down into smaller pieces so it's easier to consume. In addition to all of this, they have pedipalps, which you can see here. And we talked about pedipalps, how they can help with uh, sensing the environment and spiders. But they can also play a role in feeding, so helping them catch prey. And then in the males, they can actually use their pedipalps during reproduction because what the males do is um, they will deposit their sperm into something called a sperm web. And they'll use their pedipalps to scoop up the sperm. And then they will um, also use their pedipalps to deposit the sperm into the female seminal receptacle. And so the pedipalps play a various different roles in the survival um, and the lifestyle of spiders. They also have uh, eight legs, so four pairs of legs. And in this picture up here, you can only see four because it's only half the spider, but you can see one, two, three, and four. And at the ends of their, uh, of their legs, the very tips, which you can't see in this picture because they're not drawn, but in this area here, they have claws at the very bottom. And their legs also are covered in setae, so those tiny hairs, and that helps them to sense movement in their environment. So whether it be uh, changes in the wind or changes in vibration um, and things like that, um, it helps them to sense the world around them, especially because a lot of them have very poor eyesight. Well, let's erase some of this. There we go. Spiders have uh, both lungs and trachea for respiration. And you can see the lungs in this top picture here. They're not very easy to see, but they're here. Um, and then they also have trachea that help them with respiration. The trachea that we see in spiders are different. Um, they're analogous to the trachea that we see in insects. So um, this is due to uh, convergent evolution, not because they have a shared common ancestor. And then for excretion, they have a structure called malpighian tubules. And that can be seen in this picture down here. These kind of squid looking like uh, structures in this picture are the malpighian tubules. 
and they extend into the body and they're responsible for uptaking hemolymph that contains uric acid. So water, uric acid, and salts go into the mouth pig in tubules and it travels down the tubule to the gut where it is joined with the feces. So the feces and the uh, liquid waste are mixed together. And then as all the waste is traveling down the gut towards the anus, the water and salts that are present in the uh, feces will be removed because the organism needs those things. And this will cause the uh, waste to become almost like a dry paste, but when it's removed from the anus, because all the water has basically been removed at that point. So what leaves the animal is uric acid, which is their nitrogenous waste, and their feces um, via the anus. The Malpighian tubules that we see in spiders are also analogous to those that we see in insects. And then if you've ever walked in the woods or walked outside your house early morning, uh, you probably already know the next fact that I'm going to say, but spiders can produce silk. And uh, this silk comes from these glands on their body called silk glands, and they're a bit hard to see in this upper image, but I'm going to try to put a square around them here. So those silk glands are right um, in front of these uh, two structures we call spinnerets. And these are the spinnerets here. And the, um, the silk glands are responsible for making liquid protein that are, is excreted through the spinnerets. And the spinnerets um, kind of form those, that liquid protein into uh, threads. And so that liquid protein, once it leaves the uh, spider, becomes solidified and becomes the silk. And then the spinnerets take a lot of those uh, fibers and bring them together and bind them together to make a singular thread. The um, spiders can use net uh, webs for a variety of purposes. They can use them for lining their nests. So this is really common in spiders that live in burrows. They will also sometimes have a um, a uh, web around the entrance to their burrow and around their nests. They can use them for attachment. They can use them for catching prey, obviously. They can use them to bridge between areas. Um, currently, outside of my window outside, I have a large, relatively large spider that's decided to make a bridge between my porch and my neighbor's porch. So <laughs> I can see this firsthand. Um, and then also, if you ever get a chance, just watching how spiders go about making their webs is actually quite interesting. It's a lot of work that they put into making these webs um, because for many of them, it can be the difference between life and death. Um, some spiders cannot make silk, so they do not make webs. Instead, they basically chase their prey down. Um, they're active hunters, so they chase their prey and then consume them after the chase is over. And then as I mentioned in the, in the reproductive process of spiders, the males will use their, um, uh, uh, sorry, petty palps. They'll use the petty palps to scoop up sperm and uh, deposit it into the female sem seminal receptacle. And that's how they're able to um, start the process of reproduction. So I know many of you are like me and you're a little bit wary of spiders. And that's really because spiders have gotten a really bad rep. But in actuality, spiders are the good guys. Um, they help us in a variety of ways. And one of the major ways is they consume both annoying pests and potentially dangerous pests um, that live around our homes or in our homes or in our environment. Some examples, uh, ticks, mites, uh, and mosquitoes are just a few um, pests that can cause serious problems to humans, especially because they can oftentimes carry disease that spiders actively hunt these guys and eat them. So um, they're doing us a solid. Um, so this is not the case for all spiders. There are some venomous spiders out there. Um, in the US, we have the black widow spider and the brown recluse. The black widow makes a neurotoxin and the brown recluse makes a hemotoxin. But in both cases, the number of fatal cases of uh, bites from either of these spiders is very low. Um, so for the most part, it's painful, but they won't kill you. Um, I'm not saying go out there and, and get these spiders or touch them or, or play with them, but just keep in mind that there are some dangerous spiders, but the vast majority of them, at least in the United States, are pretty uh, helpful. 
And actually that extends to most parts of the world. Now, some parts of the world do have more um, dangerous spiders out there. Like Australia has a lot of them in some regions of South America. Um, so you're probably like, what are you talking about? Spiders are bad. But um, if you look at the grand scheme of things of all the types of spiders all over the planet, the vast majority of them will only bite you if they feel like they're threatened or they're trying to protect their young. And their venom when they do bite you is not lethal. So most of the time, if I uh, have a spider and it's not causing me a major problem, um, if, especially if they're small spiders that live in corners, sometimes I tend to leave them there. People don't like that, but I tend to leave them there um, because at the end of the day, they're eating a lot of pests that would normally cause me other problems and, and strife. So just something to consider. Order Scorpiones includes the scorpions. And they're pretty well known or pretty famous for their modified pedipalps that have their claws, um, pincer-like uh, projections on the ends, and then they have their barb at the end of their tail. So the uh, scorpions have a pretty short cephalothorax when you compare it to the cephalothorax in spiders. So that's this whole area in the scorpions. And their cephalothorax has uh, their modified pedipalps, which they're really well known for that have their pincer like projections on the end. They also have their uh, chalicerae, which are here, and they also have pincer like uh, claws on the ends as well instead of fangs. And then they have their four pairs of legs. So the one, two, three, four pairs. In addition to all of this, they also have a, a lot of eyes. <laughs> um, they have two large eyes which you can see in this picture here and here. And they also have between four and 10 smaller eyes, which are harder to see, but they're located here. They have um, a quite large abdomen and their abdomen has two major parts. So they have a pre-abdomen, which is composed of seven segments and uh, we'll label those, let's erase all of this. So their pre-abdomen has seven segments and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And then they have their post abdomen, which has five segments. So one, two, three, four, and five. And at the very end of their post abdomen, they have their, um, their uh, stinger, which is this uh, structure here. And their stinger is composed of a bulb and a barb. So the bulb part is this larger, more uh, robust part. And then the barb is this sharp pointy piece here for uh, the actual injecting. Um, so the uh, bulb contains the venom and the barb helps to penetrate the prey so that the venom can go from the bulb through the barb into the prey and uh, incapacitate them. Generally, for humans, the sting is painful. It's similar to a bee sting, but it's not fatal. Um, but you still don't want to get stung, right? So keep an eye out for these guys. We do have scorpions in Georgia, if you didn't already know that. Um, since I've moved to this house, we've seen two or three in this home. So keep an eye out for them, especially at night if you have dark floors. And um, the smaller species are generally more venomous than the larger species. So keep that in mind. They also have sensory organs that help them to locate their prey and discern between the male and female sexes. And the uh, reproduction process in uh, scorpions is actually kind of like weird. Um, and it seems a little aggressive. So the males and females will lock together um, using their, their pincers on their pedipalps. And then once they're ready to reproduce, the male will deposit a spermatophore onto the, the ground and will pull the female over top of that spermatophore until and hold her there until the sperm is able to be taken up by her uh, her reproductive organs. So that's kind of like, feels kind of like a tug of war really. It's It was kind of weird and, and interesting reading about it um, in, in the textbook. And then, um, after reproduction has occurred, scorpions are viviparous, so they give birth to live young. So instead of giving birth to eggs, they will give birth to actual little bitty bitty baby scorpions. Sometimes they look a little bit transparent. Um, I didn't include a picture here because to me it looks kind of gross, but um, they will sometimes carry their young on their backs and kind of uh, nurture them until they're ready to go free. And then all scorpions are terrestrial. 
The last group of arachnids we're going to talk about are those that belong to the order Acari, and this includes ticks and mites. And so in these organisms, their cephalothorax and their abdomen have become fused into one piece, and they just keep their mouth and their mouth parts on an anterior projection that lies before the rest of their body. So you can see that here, their uh, anterior projection is this piece here, and then all of the rest of this is the rest of their body that is the fused cephalothorax and abdomen. In addition to their mouth parts and their mouth being on that anterior projection, they also keep their uh, chalicera and their pedipalps also on that anterior projection. In addition to all of this, they also have between one and four pairs of legs. Um, the number of legs can vary depending on the species. In this picture, this one clearly has four, but sometimes they can have fewer. The ticks and mites can be aquatic or terrestrial, so really nowhere is safe. Um, and they can be free living or parasitic. But um, either way, many times they are parasitic at some point in their lifetime, even some of the free living ones. So ticks and mites can cause disease in a couple of different ways. One, they can cause disease and um, agricultural problems uh, by themselves just because they're present. So an uh, example can be spider mites. They are a um, plant pest that causes some serious issues in agricultural plants. Um, those of you guys who ever been a kid and you'd like to roll outside in the grass, you probably are familiar with chickers or people call them red bugs. Um, they are, they, I used to be told all the time when I was a kid to make sure you didn't roll around the grass and to wear high socks because you didn't want to get chiggers. And um, these are essentially a uh, version of um, arthropod that the larva will eat your dermal cells and this can cause uh, itching for, for people. And that can also cause something called Asi Asiatic uh, scrub typhus which is not good. It's more than just more than just itching, but um, this might be something that you might have heard about as a, as a child or even if you go out hiking a lot in modern day. And then you have itch mites, which these guys actually burrow under your skin and can cause itching. So um, of course that's problematic for people. And um, you can have colony collapse um, in uh, bees, which is a major problem agriculturally for humans all around the world because we need bees, they're major pollinators, and what's happening is these um, varro mites are attaching, attacking the bees and causing them to become deformed and unable to um, survive and do their job properly. So I include a picture here where this is a, a honeybee and um, they all this area here has been infested with mites. And so when you look closely, you can see the mites in this picture, all of these little guys. And you can see how these mites, there's so many of them. If that bee goes back to its colony and then those mites just jump from bee to bee to bee, you can end up basically wiping out an entirely, entire colony of honeybees. And um, this is problematic, one, because of honey, but two, because like I mentioned, they're pollinators and they're pollinators for a lot of agriculturally important crops as well. So without these bees, um, we're pretty screwed. And bees are under attack from mites and they're also under attack from various fungi as well. So we got to protect the bees. Mites and ticks can also cause problems because they are vectors of disease. Um, they're the second most dangerous vectors of disease, only second to mosquitoes. And they can uh, transmit apicomplexin uh, parasites, viral parasites, bacterial parasites, like all types of parasites um, can be transmitted from person to person or animal to animal um, as these um, organisms go from drinking um, blood from one host to another host. And some diseases that you guys might be familiar with that are uh, born from ticks and mites are Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain Spotted, Rocky Mountain spotted Fever. And then you also have um, Texas Cattle Fever um, in, in cows, obviously. So ticks and mites are hugely problematic for people. And um, of course, when you go to um, get your pets treated, you want to make sure that you're getting them treated for um, mites and ticks as well to make sure that you're protecting them from disease. The last subphylum we're going to address in this lecture is Myriapoda. And Myriapoda just means many footed. And if you can't tell from the pictures on the side why they get their name, you'll be able to tell in a second. Um, the Myriapods have two tagmata. So they have a head, 
which is here. And then they have a trunk. And their trunk is everything that's posterior to their head. And the trunk is segmented and each segment has a pair of legs. So they can have one to two pairs of legs and we'll uh, see more examples of that up close in the next couple of slides. They have trachea to undergo respiration, but the trachea in myriapods is analogous to the trachea that we see in insects and the trachea we see in arachnids. So trachea um, evolved several times in animal history. Additionally, they have malpighian tubules, which uh, help them with excretion of waste, but these um, malpighian tubules are analogous to the ones that we see in chelicerates. So what we see in the spiders and scorpions is not the same um, structures, they're not from a, a shared derived ancestor as the malpighian tubules that we see in the myriapods. There are four classes that um, fall under this subphylum, and that includes chilopoda, which include the centipedes, diplopoda, which include the millipedes, pyropoda, um, and symphyla, which those two we're not really gonna talk about um, in this lecture. Chilopoda are the centipedes, and they have a long segmented flat body, and you can see that in this picture up here. They have a head that have antennae, which you can see in this picture here and here. So these are the first um, arthropods we're talking about that have antennae. So those long appendage like projections on the head that help them sense their environment. They also have mandibles, which are like here for them, for them to grip their food and uh, chew it up and break it up into smaller pieces. And they have maxilla, which they use for manipulating the food and tasting the food. They don't have true eyes. Instead, they have groups of ocelli on either side of their head, which are these guys, um, that help them with sensing their environment. Their bodies can um, be composed of over 150 segments. Like they can be extremely long. Um, and each segment has a pair of legs. So there's one um, on each side of either of each segment. With the exception of the first segment that's after the head, that segment doesn't have legs. And then the uh, two last segments do not have um, legs either. There are a pair of longer, uh, legs for sensing at the very back of the organism and um, you can see those in this picture as well Let's see a color that you can see these longer legs that they can use for sensing their environment are at the very very posterior end each uh, segment also has a pair of arteries so that they can um, circulate their blood properly and they have ostia to return the blood to the heart from the hemocele because they're so long right they have a heart at one end they need to make sure that they're able to um, effectively uh, move all of their uh, blood throughout their entire bodies because they're active carnivores or active hunters and then they each uh, segment also has a pair of spicules to undergo um, respiration using their trachea uh, centipedes are viviparous, so they can give uh, birth to live young, and then some also lay eggs, but um, it depends on which species you're looking at, if they're going to give birth to live young or if they're going to lay eggs. They do not undergo metamorphosis in either case, and they are terrestrial, and they're carnivores. So I mentioned that they're active hunters. They um, have venom in their claws and mandibles, so they have, you can see here in this picture, they have a fang here um, that helps them with injecting their venom into their prey and then their mandibles help them to um, process the prey, mash it up into smaller pieces so that they can uh, properly consume their prey. Most of their venom is not dangerous to humans for the most part, um, but it, they're pretty gross, honestly. I don't care for them. The class Diplopoda include the millipedes, which I actually do like. Um, to me, they're quite adorable and they're really, really quite harmless. Um, they eat leaves, they're herbivores, and they're actually really helpful to the environment because they help to clear a lot of the leaf litter in forests and parks and things like that. Um, so they're, they're the good guys, even though they kind of look a little creepy to some people. They're really, really harmless. And so millipedes on their head, they have an antenna like we saw in um, 
the centipedes, but their antenna is generally shorter. And they also have maxilla and mandibles as well, but they're structurally different because they're not carnivores, so they don't have to hunt, so they don't have fangs and things like that. But they do have maxilla and mandibles for um, processing their food and tasting it. In addition to this, they also have two clumps of eyes, both on, on both sides of their heads. And these clumps of simple eyes are allow them to uh, sense their environment. The trunk of diplopods, um, the millipedes, are composed of up to and maybe even over a hundred segments in length. And each segment, with the exception of the first four, have two pairs of legs. So the first four segments, so segments one, two, three, and four, all have one pair of legs. So each of those segments have two uh, legs in total. But all the segments after this fourth segment have two pairs of legs. So they have four legs in total. And um, this is why it looks like they have so many legs is because it's double the amount of what you would expect in like a centipede. And then um, each of those segments also have two pairs of spicules. So in centipedes, we saw they only had one pair of spicules, so they had two per segment. In millipedes, they have two pairs of spicules, so they have four spicules per segment. The exoskeleton of millipedes is reinforced with calcium carbonate, so they have a much thicker and um, uh, stronger exoskeleton than, than let's say, uh, arthropod, I mean, uh, arachnids like spiders and, and um, mites. They do lay eggs, so they don't give birth to live young, unlike centipedes. But once their larvae hatch from their eggs, they actually only have one pair of legs per segment instead of two. They don't develop that second pair until they've uh, undergone growth and developed and matured. And like I mentioned before, millipedes are herbivores and they eat a lot of leaf litter that's on the bottom of the forest floor. Um, they are terrestrial and then they are really quite harmless, um, but they have to figure out ways to protect themselves. And so sometimes they'll roll up into a ball to try to protect themselves from danger. You can see this if you uh, kind of provoke one enough, it'll roll up to protect itself. Um, also, you can see them rolled up if they get exposed to pesticides that cause their muscles to contract, they'll also roll up into a ball um, once they're dead. Some of them also can produce um, toxins that help to protect them from predators. So these toxins aren't uh, lethal to us or anything like that, but they definitely discourage, let's say, birds and um, like maybe spiders and other things that may try to eat them. Alrighty, so you made it to the end of the chapter uh, 19 lectures, our first lecture on arthropods. Go ahead and read chapter 19, sections one through four, and then also do the connect assignment for chapter 19. And then feel free to watch any of the videos that I've linked here, or any videos you find on the internet that help you to uh, see these organisms in action and also to better understand them. So the next lecture will be uh, chapter 20, and we're gonna be talking about crustaceans.